Mary Helen Dara, Taylor Automotive Family, women in the driver's seat. And today I have the fun and privilege of being with fellow ambassador, Victoria Kimmel, and she is gonna tell us who's in the driver's seat today. Thanks, Mary Helen. I'm so happy to be here at Cornerstone of Hope. And we're going to be going in and talking with Carrie Taylor, the executive director. She's very inspirational and I can't wait for you to hear what she has to say. Well, let's go inside. Let's do it. I'm here today with Carrie Taylor from Cornerstone of Hope and really excited to talk to you about women in the driver's seat. Can you tell us a bit about your journey that led you to your leadership role as an executive director at Cornerstone of Hope in Lima? Absolutely. So Cornerstone of Hope actually began in Cleveland, Ohio, and there I served as a counselor and as a group coordinator. The Cornerstone of Hope in Cleveland was specifically for grief counseling, for those who had lost a loved one. And I uh, loved what I did there, but I, my husband's job moved us here to Lima. So when I moved here to Lima, I spent some time getting our family adjusted and uh, began looking for where do I want to use this counseling uh, license that I have? How can I contribute to the community? Found out quickly that we were at a severe deficit for mental health care in this area. Cornerstone is a faith-based counseling center, so we really integrate that in. We don't force that on anyone, but we do integrate that in. And so come to find out there was not that type of counseling available in quite a large radius yeah. from Allen County. And so we talked with Cornerstone at Hope in Cleveland, and they said, well, why don't you open a practice in the Lima area that would still be Cornerstone of Hope, but would see a variety. So we'd see more of a range of clients, not just grief specific. And I, I loved their organization, loved what they believed in. And so I thought, well, okay, well, let's try this. Really didn't know what it would be like, know what it would turn into. So it started with just me in 2014 began seeing clients, doing things in the community, running groups, speaking at different things. And to this day, it has grown exponentially each, each year. There are 15 of us on staff now. And we have an office in the Bluffton area as well. We serve around 130, 135 clients per week um, and run a ton of groups, do a lot of speaking in the community. That So my role kind of started organically. Uh, we weren't sure what it was going to be, but we knew there was a need. We knew there was a need, we knew there was a deficit, and so began to start serving. And when you realize a need, it tends to, to kind of, you know, balloon up, I guess, um, when, when you tap into one, right? And so as I started bringing on counselors and, and um, more and more uh, people really qualified to do this work, then it's grown um, over the years. And so I guess my role kind of evolved into the executive director. That wasn't really what I set out to be, mm -hmm. but it has grown into that. It's been such a privilege. I love that. And I, I just love the important mission that you have in the community and how that has grown organically, to use your words, to really fulfill the needs in the community. And it's still growing, mm -hmm. right? You're still evolving based on where those needs are. Absolutely. Can you tell us more about the services that Cornerstone of Hope offers? Mm -hmm. For sure. So we serve children, teens, and adults. We start at age five. Teens and adults, we do marriage and family counseling as well. So our primary service is individual counseling and marriage and family counseling. We see any anything from grief, trauma, addiction, anxiety, depression, stress, mm -hmm. behavior concerns, you name it. Uh, we, we see quite a wide range of needs coming in through our office. And so that's primarily what we're doing. In addition to that, though, we also provide support groups and we, we watch for trends in the clients we're serving or, or trends in the community. We call it taking the pulse of our clients in our community. What are the needs? And then we develop groups out of those needs because we believe people heal best when they're no, they're not alone. Mm -hmm. Another huge aspect of what we do is to provide trainings and workshops in the community. So we are, I mean, any given month, we're out in the community three or four times or even more than that, speaking at, at churches, at schools, at businesses, at nonprofits, at all different kind of organizations to equip them with tools that they need to in, in a myriad of topics. And so we are very, very honored to do that. But really, and all of our staff would say this, we 
create, we see ourselves as equippers. So whether we're seeing an individual client, uh, marriage of family, whether we are doing a group or offering a training in the community, our primary goal is that we are equipping those people with tools that they can take and use immediately in life to bring hope, to bring a sense of confidence, um, you know, or some skills that they didn't know were there and available to them so that they can live life to the fullest. So they can really put into action what they've learned That's immediately. Right. That's right. And I can vouch for you being out in the community. We bump into each other quite often. And so I think that's really unique about Cornerstone of Hope. Um, not only do you have people come to you, but you go out to reach people. Absolutely, absolutely. That has been a critical piece of what we do is to realize we don't want people to always have to come to us, <clears throat> but we have a community that we serve. And we, it's such an honor to go into, to them and serve with them. And we've been able to do that, not just in speaking places, but in running groups and doing trainings and teachings and places like the Access Center downtown and Family Promise and some different, different settings where sometimes people couldn't get to us, but we have the privilege to go to them. I love that. What are the few, few of the most challenging and rewarding aspects of what you do? I'm a dreamer. And so one of the most challenging things for me as a leader and probably for our team as a whole here is figuring out what needs can we meet? We want to meet them all, you know, and we hear the needs and we want to do something. We have all these ideas and it's trying to learn to use wisdom and discernment at which, which can we meet at this time? Which ones do we need to wait for a little bit to, to do so that we can do everything we do well? right? Because if, if we do too many things, then we don't do them well. And so I think that is probably, as for me personally, as a dreamer, that's one of the hardest things that I have to do is to kind of like, okay, let's take this idea or all these thoughts and let's make sure, is it manageable? Is it doable? Is it meeting a need? You know, do we have the capacity? Do we have the people? Do we have the time to make it excellent so that it serves our community well? The most rewarding thing that we get to do as a staff, we would say, it comes in this phrase we use a lot here of, um, we get to push back the darkness. And we absolutely love this opportunity. We are so humble to get to do it, but to push back the darkness with truth, with equipping people, uh, watching, we get to sit on the front lines of watching people heal, watching mm -hmm. them find hope again, watching um, them gain skills or a whole new perspective that gives them a new way of living. And so getting to sit on the front lines and pushing back the darkness is probably the most rewarding thing we get to do. That's, that's powerful. A powerful statement, pushing back the darkness. Mm -hmm. I, I really admire that and that you get to do that. That's really cool. What advice would you offer to young women or young men alike uh, who want to get behind the driver's wheel and lead an organization like Cornerstone of Hope? That's a great question. So I'm going to say three different things. Um, one is if you're going to start a nonprofit of any kind, expect that it will be difficult. It, this is not an easy thing to do, to start something from the ground up, to, to start with a mission that you so believe in. Uh, but when you know what that mission is and you know why you're doing it, then the hard stuff becomes purposeful, right? I, I can do that. I will press through the hard because I believe that I, in what we're doing, I believe in, in what will, this will provide to the community or how it will help someone. Don't think it's gonna be an easy job, but it can be very rewarding. Second thing is, I would say as a leader, especially if you're starting a nonprofit, expect or, or plan to humble yourself enough to do menial tasks, mm -hmm. right? You're not gonna start this as a, you have a full staff and you've got everybody to do all the different things, you're gonna have to do a lot of different roles, wear a lot of different hats, and that's normal. That's okay, and, and I have found personally that has given me great appreciation as we have grown and been able to add other staff why do I appreciate what each of them bring? I still take out the trash sometimes. Like that's still part of my, part of what I contribute, you know, mm -hmm. it's still sometimes cleaning, cleaning off bathrooms and, you know, things like that. But we do it as a team that this is, I'm not the executive director and everybody else does the other things. I serve with them. And so I think that's a really important thing to remember. And then the third thing I would probably tell young men or young women who are thinking of starting a nonprofit is don't assume you know what your community needs listen first. Listen to the community. Get out in, in the community. Talk to leaders. Talk to schools. Talk to community agencies. Talk to places and say, what are you seeing? What are the needs? What are, what are the, the needs not getting met? And then you'll know best how to meet them. And then you get to be creative. 
how do we how do we find a solution for that need and then it gets fun I love that. And that's really powerful. Those uh, apply to really anything you do in life, mm -hmm. right? right? The nonprofit or for-profit. Thank you for yeah. sharing that. Uh, what are a couple of accomplishments that you are most proud of? I would say a couple of things that I'm most proud of probably more recently with Cornerstone and the team that, that I get to work with here is the involvement that, or the, the, I guess, the invitation we have had to come in to speak to leaders. So we have developed a healthy leader kind of uh, education, I guess, where we, we've done a survey to find out what leaders in our community are needing the most to be healthy leaders, which then impact their teams, which then impacts our community. Um, we've created healthy leader workshops out of those. We've done a lot of, we've been invited into more and more businesses. This isn't something we set out to do. This is something we started to hear from clients, boy, this is a need. And we started to hear it as we were in the community. And so we thought, well, how can we respond to that? And so then we took a survey to learn what does our community need, not just what do we think leaders need, and being able to respond to those. And that has been an unexpected privilege that we've had to really invest in leaders. Another one of uh, the accomplishments I think we're just so honored to do is our courageous parenting curriculum. So anytime we work with parents, we call it courageous parenting because it is stinking hard to parent well. And we, our tagline is parent how they need, not how they want. And it takes courage to do that, to do that well. And uh, as we began like listening to all the times we're talking to parents in our office and how we're trying to equip them, we've created this courageous parenting curriculum that we, we teach in workshops for different ages. We've gone out into the community and done this. We've been invited into places where parents are needing this, that they would never make it to Cornerstone, but they are finally saying, we have hope. We never knew these skills. We didn't know we could do it this way. That has been so such a privilege for our team to get to build into people and give parents hope that they can parent well and kind of shift, uh, I guess, shift the tide that it was going in one direction with, with kids and with parents and being able to actually equip them so it can we can push back on that and start going in a direction that gives parents a lot of hope and I think really affects the kids well. Mm -hmm. So that's, those have been a couple, I think, unexpected things. We didn't set out to do those, but those, again, are the things that as we listen to our community, as we listen to our clients, we were those things were raising up and we were taking the pulse and saying, we got to respond to this. Mm -hmm. And so just proud of our team. How powerful. Those are two great examples. Now, how powerful to help, you know, parents, you know, be courageous in, in their parenting and, and leaders be mm -hmm. courageous as leaders. So Absolutely. the ripple effect, right, mm -hmm. of, Absolutely. of, of uh, you know, helping those people through those, those audiences. That's really cool. What support does Cornerstone of Hope need from the local community? We have a couple different ways. So we have our annual fund, and we're actually doing a week of hope with that coming up on the first week in November, November 6th through the 10th. And uh, and we'll be sharing some stories and some videos of people we've worked with and, and ways we get to push back darkness. And that'll be a really special week, but it's just, it's just a giving, you know, a financial giving to that. Another way that we have is what we call Partners in Hope. Partners in Hope is uh, will be start through the year 2024, and each month represents a, a different type of service that we provide. And so businesses or, or individuals or families, um, agencies who say, that's an area I believe in, or I've been touched personally by that, or, or we know someone who's been touched personally by that, we would like to give to that. And that's giving a, a, a minimum of $1,000, which will then put your name in our lobby and, and honor you, know, you for that month, um, which then helps us offset the cost so that we can still provide the services that we need to to our community, that no one is held up by that and getting. getting I love that. Stuff. Partners in Hope. Yeah. And mm -hmm. so that's coming in 2024. Yes. What, yes. a, what a great idea. And, and I just have to say too, I just, I love the, the theme of hope, right? In your name and in your programs and who doesn't want to be filled with hope, right? I mean, I feel like that will attract so many people uh, to you to benefit from what you do. Carrie, it's been a pleasure. Thank you so much for being part of Women in the Driver's Seat. Yeah. Thank you so much for having me. It's yeah. a privilege. Thank you, Carrie Taylor, for spreading your mission of hope in this community. Thank you, Carrie and Cornerstone of Hope. And let's head in, on down the road to the next Women in the Driver's Seat.